Right now, our session today is on tips for student engagement, and we're going to focus today on some of the research, but more importantly, we're going to focus on those successful strategies that you use, that I've used in our face-to-face -face classrooms, and how we can transfer those strategies to our online classrooms. Super important. So again, we ask that you keep your microphones muted. You don't have to have your camera on, but we, we, we welcome you to do so. And uh, we will begin. So the first thing that we're going to do is invite you to a Slido. So on the screen, you see slido.com. If you are able to, we would like you to go on to slido.com or if you have a smartphone, you could take your smartphone, open up the camera, put the camera right to that QR code and on your smartphone, you will be connected right to our first poll which is based on the question you see on your screen. What are some ways you have engaged our students in class, face-to-face -face and online? So feel free to go ahead and do that right now, please. Slido.com, there's the event code. You'll see the text box for that code, 83908. And if you happen to have your phone handy, just take the camera option, click, put the, put the camera right to the code and voila, it should pop right up. So let's see what we have right now. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see our word cloud. Can you all see that word cloud? Yes? Melody, can you see the word cloud? Yes, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> So what are some ways you've engaged our students in your face-to-face -face or online classroom? I see discussions, super important. Questioning, group activities, online labs, thank you so much. Discussion seems to be a heavy hit. Face-to-face -face labs, external publisher sites. Slido, yes, use Slido in the future. It's super easy, it's free. Any more, any more ideas? I'm gonna hold out. There may be 15 more seconds. Kahoot, videos, excellent. So I see a lot of discussion and that's excellent because we're gonna talk a lot about engaging, engaging students via discussion today. So let's go back now to our PowerPoint. Hold on one second. A little bit of a freeze here. There we go. Yeah. All righty. Does everybody see the slide? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. So yeah. what we wanted to do for you today is start with some of the research but then we want to take that research and we want to bring it into what I'm referring to as our practitioner's corner. So this in my mind is similar to what we would talk about in the hallway or you know, the water cooler. I like to make it a little more formal and fancy and say practitioner's corner. And so some of the, some of the research that you see on the screen right now is I guarantee 100% what you are already doing in your face-to-face -face classrooms. And Melody and I are gonna share with you today some ways that you can take these successful strategies and bring them into your online classrooms. Paraphrasing, we have our students restate. We have them select and, and note take, right? So they're deciding what's critical and what's important. Questioning is big. We saw this in the discussions uh, just a few moments ago on Slido. Summarizing, our students need to be able to summarize in their own words. And then of course, we all need to be using wait time. And wait time, according to Roe, is five seconds or more. And we know research tells us that when we wait, although it may be uncomfortable for us, when we wait in an online discussion or face-to-face -face for at least five seconds, 
we have a greater participation, the responses are of higher quality, the students are thinking a little bit deeper, and they're questioning. And so we have that more opportunity for the cycle of inquiry to happen, which is what we want. Now, how do we take all of this and bring it into our online classroom? Well, here are a few tips for you, and I'm sure you are already doing this now in your online class as well as face-to-face. -face. There's something called the 10 to 2 rule, which some of us may uh, think of it as maybe a, a, a KWL, you know, what you know, what you want to know, what you learn. Some of us may just break our students up into small groups. But the big idea is that as an instructor, research tells us that whether we're presenting like this online, whether we're in our face-to-face -face classroom, that it's really important that we don't speak for more than 10 minutes at a time. And once we have hit that 10 minute mark, students are zoning out, they're thinking of different things, the focus is just not there. So we wanna at least limit that 10 minute time. And so for those of us who are more familiar with the lecture style of 20, 30 minutes, we really wanna reconsider breaking that lecture style up into 10 minute hits. And at the end of the first 10 minutes, we need to give our students time to process. And what this looks like for us when we're using Zoom is using that breakout session. Get the students, you, you know during, you know, with the Zoom permissions rather, you can preset your breakout rooms, you can manually set them, you can have Zoom just put people in, in alternative rooms on it, you know, randomly. Alisa? Sorry yes. to in interrupt. Uh, yeah. We cannot see the PowerPoint. You cannot see it. Well, that's not good, is it? Let me try that again. How about now? Yep. Now? Good. What were you seeing? What were you seeing? Was it just me talking? It was there and then it went away. Oh, okay. Thank no. you. Thank you. So well, now it's back. Okay, good. So we're back to the 10 2 2 rule. All right. So in any event, I mean, you get the idea. It's really important, right? So you're, you're strategically thinking about those chunks of time in 10 minutes. You're providing students with at least two minutes to process in small groups. And then you're allowing them time, two minutes to reflect on their own. This 10 to 2 rule, which is, I mean, let's just say for argument's sake, 15 minutes of the, of the time that you're with them on Zoom is very powerful. Now imagine bringing your students back after 10 minutes, two minutes and two minutes. So let's say bringing them back in 15 minutes. And during that two minutes of breakout time and maybe reflection, you're popping in and out of breakout rooms and you're hearing the conversation. So imagine 15 minutes later, well, now you're able to take what you just heard in each of those small breakout rooms and then uh, that will inform your continued conversation with them. So here are some other, if we go to our practitioner's corner now, here are some other ways that we can engage our students in those discussions. There's something called, in terms of paraphrasing, there's a strategy called A-B mind streaming. This is something you could, again, put, you could put students in small groups, and A-B would be one person is A, the other person is B. And for each A and then B, they have one minute to paraphrase what they just heard or what they think that 10 minute lecture was all about. And at the end of that one minute, it reverses to the person B and then person B paraphrases. Now, you may be thinking, well, person A, well, they have to start, person B gets it easy. Yes, person B could copy, but what I found when I use this strategy, and it, it's not, it's not a, a, a copy to copy, it's person B, if they are going to copy A, there's a little wiggle room there. But the big idea here is that they're attending with each other and they're able to paraphrase and listen to each other. Selecting or note taking, you could get them in small groups and you could have them share the, the big ideas that they individually just heard during that 10 minute lecture time. Questioning, it's the same idea. You can give them questions that they can talk about during the two minute time, or you can have them generate questions together as a group. And then when they come back to the whole group, they can take the one or two questions that they've created together and they can ask the whole group. Summarizing, there's a really great strategy called magnet summaries. A magnet summary is when the students pull out those words that we would consider magnets. So the big ideas, they stick out. So they stick, 
it's supposed to be like they stick to the brain. So the students would create a magnet summary highlighting those one, two, or three magnet words that are pulled right from the right from the last conversation of that 10 minute topic. And, it, and then there's the one sentence summary. So you see that there are ways that we can take the 10 to 2 rule, have you present some content information, give them two minutes of uh, debriefing on their own, two minutes of processing on their own, reflecting, and then coming back around. And I'd like to open up, uh, just take a pause for a moment and see if anyone has any comments uh, if anyone would like to open up their microphone and share some some ideas or thoughts. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I kind of imagined doing this and then telling my students, okay, go off in your breakout rooms and talk to each other. And they just kind of like, what do we do? What are we supposed to do? We're just mm -hmm. no idea. And then they come back and I say, okay, guys, how did it go? And then I get rather feeble responses. Yes. So that's not a reason for us not to do it, however, right? So what can we do when we know that's going to happen? We anticipate that's going to happen. How can we prepare our students or what can we do ahead of time to address this and minimize the, the percentage that this may happen? Any ideas? I have some ideas. Sure. Okay, um, I could uh, present them with a puzzle or give them some type of problem because if there's an object, if there's a, a goal they have to achieve, now that this could be anything from, uh, for what I do, they have to calculate the number of ATPs from glycolysis. They have to work that out and then they have to tell me. So I don't tell them that early on. I just talk about the other stuff mm -hmm. uh, and they have to do that. So that's a... Um, uh, that's just a way to give them a tangible, actionable task, as it were, that they can do. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I, I could in, intentionally uh, say something that's wrong and tell them, okay, in, in the past five minutes, I just said something that's wrong. You have to tell me what it is. Go back over. Uh, uh, I might even have like a little sheet they can look at because I can't not, because I'm not going to remember everything I said. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I can say, look at the sheet. And, and tell me what's wrong. And maybe I don't mention that as wrong, but I just have the sheet. There's a bunch of stuff. You guys talk it over and get back to me and 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 and, and, and uh, tell me what's wrong. Or I could have several sheets where I say, you, you, and you take sheet A, you, you, and you take sheet B, you, you, and you take sheet C, and pick out the wrong things. Yeah. So, so, so clearly there are ways that we can ahead of time proactively set our students up for success using something like the 10 to 2 rule. So I'm going to share a couple, you know, on that idea, Dave, I'm going to share my screen once again, and I'm going to bring us to anticipation guides. Can you all see that anticipation guides on your screen? Thumbs up. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. So an anticipation guide, first and foremost, is a flexible a document or a template, if you will. And what it does is just what it says. It, it helps the student anticipate the learning. Two things. The first thing is that it activates background knowledge. The second, it hooks students into wanting to learn more. So specifically, the students are presented with concepts that allow them to think about what they already know perhaps misconcep misconceptions. So the comments can be a statement that you write that reflects a larger segment, true or false statements, or just a statement itself that uh, you're gonna word the statement so that it provokes that critical thinking. So it's literally a document that you could have in your online classroom and you ask them to fill it out ahead of time. So for example, if you imagine the true false statement, I have an example to show you in just a moment, but if you consider true false. So just before the lecture or just before your class, you have the students fill out the anticipation guide. And it's simply, they, they, it could, they could be a agree, disagree to the statement. It could be a true, false. They select whether the statements are true or false. Then they engage in the class. At the end of the class, they revisit 
their anticipation guide to see if they've changed their mind. So they're thinking prior to their exposure to the new information or the engaging activity, it, you know, more than likely will be different than the end. So I'll give you a very specific example. Um, I shared with many of you about my story when I taught uh, fifth grade science and the, uh, uh, the arachnid, we had an arachnid unit and the boys were saying, they were arguing that whether or not spiders had skeletons and one boy was emphatic. He said, yes, they do because when he steps on them, they crunch. So one of my statements could be spiders have skeletons. And before the class time, my students would fill out and one of the statements is spiders have skeletons and they would mark true or false. During my class, when we were talking and we're learning about the exoskeleton, right, students would then go back to the guide afterward and they would, they would correct whether or not it was, they marked true or false. And then they would give me the why. Well, it's false because they actually have exoskeletons. So the, the, the big idea here is not so much that they have to hand these in. Yes, you more than likely would want to see them. But the bigger idea is that you're allowing them in small groups or as a class to build a consensus and provide the evidence, the why behind the fact that they were thinking one thing prior to engaging in class. And now they're thinking um, something different, perhaps as a follow up. So that's one, one example of how you can really engage them in terms of what, what Dave is talking about. Um, and there are templates that I'll share with you in a moment. So here's, an, here's just an example of an anticipation guide. Um, and if you Google anticipation guides, it's endless. You will see them. It's for every subject area, every idea you could possibly think of. And there are several ways um, that, you know, in terms of the formatting. So this example that you see here, you have questions that you would provide or statements that you would provide to the students before they read or before they engage in the conversation and then after. And again, the big idea is that evidence, that reflection, um, and the, the big idea is the why behind their chain, the fact that they may or may not have changed their mind. I'm gonna move us along now to the template idea. I know Melody has an awful lot she wants to share with you as well, and I wanna be mindful of that. So templates, and I think Cleo, I think you and I at one point, uh, we talked about templates, um, and Dave, when you were just explaining some examples, you were hitting on templates as well. So these are really organizers that we provide for our students uh, to help structure their thinking. Before we use a template, and again, if you Google, <laughs> Um, you know, class templates, or you could even Google by the content of the subject area. It's endless. But the big idea here is that you're explaining the structure of the template to the students and not assuming that when they get that template, when they see it uh, uploaded into the online classroom, that they're going to know how to use it. So you will have to take a little bit of time to explain how the template is worked, is designed rather to help their thinking and their learning. Um, it's a really good idea to provide a similar sample of the template that you use in the beginning. Maybe you fill it out together. Maybe um, you know, you're giving them that annotated uh, filled out template that they can use um, when they fill out their own. Uh, they can, students can use a template during your live class on Zoom. They can use it when they're reading something um, uh, asynchronously in more of a self-directed style. Um, and they can, it, it should also include some reflection questions for them. They need to learn as a learner how templates help. So they need to be reflecting on how templates help. So something sim uh, simple like, how did this template help or hinder your thinking, your writing or whatever? Super, super valuable for students. Uh, and again, I am gonna move us along to give you some samples. So this is what I'm referencing. I just pulled out a couple. Uh, some of these are ones that I did use um, uh, when I was teaching face-to-face. Uh, and I, I often teach education courses through Southern New Hampshire University. I teach them online. And so I share these templates with my, uh, my students, uh, my education students. Again, you can go online and we're, Melody and I are gonna give you some links. You can go online and just 
plug in templates and uh, many of them will appear for you. So here are just a few examples. Now imagine you create a, st you create a template and you fill this out with your students uh, in your Zoom class. And then you provide more with them uh, for them uh, to work on independently in the class. Very, very powerful. And finally, I wanna just share a little bit about essential questions. I, I, I really believe that essential questions used in our face-to-face -face and online classrooms can have a great impact on student, uh, the evolving of student learning. So essential questions, for those of you who are not familiar, they're really designed to stimulate thought, provoke inquiry and spark more questioning. So we're not necessarily looking at that um, essential question that has a black and white yes, no answer. So they're not answerable with finality or a single lesson. And each time, the big idea here is that each time students revisit that essential question, they're coming up with a different and a deeper answer. So here are a few samples of essential questions. On the left-hand side, those are examples of not essential questions. And on the right hand, those are examples of essential questions. And you'll notice the ones on the left are answerable with a definitive answer. So what are the steps? What was that key event that sparked World War I? What is the scientific method? So students can actually answer those questions and there's definitely a right wrong answer or more so a right wrong answer. However, the question, is there ever just a war? So, and, and, and you know, for, for our English uh, composition uh, educators, how does an author create meaning in a text? Now that, the more students, so let's go back to that, is there ever just a war? The more students engage in your, uh, in your lessons, the more they read, then they go back and they see that question. Their answers are deeper because they've been exposed to more and more information that allow them to think a little bit more outside the box, if you will. Um, I believe there are millions of ways, literally millions of ways that we can use essential questioning in our face-to-face -face and online classrooms. You could set them up in your, uh, your, your, uh, your, uh, can your Canvas class. You can bring them into your um, Zoom class and present them with the same question. And you could ask them the essential question and then revisit the essential question. And for those of you who are using exit and, and uh, entrance, I'm sorry, entrance and exit slips, this is a great way to utilize that strategy, which I'll put, I won't be able to cover that today, but I will put that in the notes. So we, I've just presented several pedagogical strategies and I'm, sure that you have used, if not all of them, many of them in your face-to-face -face classroom, I encourage you to try using them, even if you try just one, try using just one in your, in your online class and um, Zoom session. So I'm going to now turn it over to Melody, who is going to continue with the presentation. Thank you, Lisa. You are welcome. Yeah, could you please? Uh, yeah, so uh, here our second slide question. Um, I would like to invite everybody to go to the slide.com again, but this time uh, use the, the event code and enter your answer for another question. So um, what are the strategy and learning activities you've tried in your face-to-face -face course that you do not think can be transferred online? Yeah, feel free to uh, provide any um, brainstorm, any ideas that you uh, previously tried, but you just do not believe it will transfer. We'll uh, come up with some solutions maybe. Um, yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, and yeah, feel free to go ahead and, and give us some of those ideas because what Melody and I are going to do is use that to help us, uh, to help inform us with, with more professional development. Are you folks able to get into the new Slido? There we go. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, complex lab work. Okay. Lisa, I had to close the old slide before I could get the new one. Oh, thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I meant to add, it's really hard to have a discuss. I'm teaching financial analysis, mm -hmm. and we're doing like present value, future value, discounted cash flows. That's uh, I didn't finish my thought um, Slido <laughs> sentence, but it's really hard to have a discussion around that. Mm -hmm. That's that's the end of my comment. <laughs> Thank you. I, and I'm looking for ideas. Okay. Excellent. Couple more seconds. Mm -hmm. Groups, yeah. Well, in, yeah, I am really um, seeing a lot of um, what will lend itself to virtual reality and augmented reality. Mm -hmm. This is great. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Obviously, I didn't turn off my ringer. Sorry. <laughs> All righty. Okay. I will go ahead and bring us back, Melody, to the... There you go. Do you see okay. the screen? Yep. Yeah. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. I can uh, see some keywords stand out uh, about your sharing, like the groups work or complex um, concepts, like how to transfer it over to um, on our online environment. So here is the matching work. Uh, we uh, ref like re reflect on what we have tried previously in the traditional face-to-face -face class, and we're trying to find the matching action or the um, similar components in the Zoom live class. For example, the using the PPT during a presentation is very common for in when you teach face-to-face -face class. Uh, majority instructors just read over the PowerPoint on monitor or big screen. In Zoom class, you can do the same. You can just share the uh, Zoom, um, use the Zoom share fu uh, function like what we are doing right now. Have your PowerPoint display on one screen and, and the teacher can uh, read over or talk through. Um, and the um, more traditional way, like the instructor, writing some keywords in the whiteboard or more previously they are using blackboard back in my time the instructor using uh, like write the equations and every uh, complex concept doing the um, on the blackboard in zoom there is a whiteboard feature uh, you can just uh, using the whiteboard and using your mouse to write the keywords or drawing pictures can do anything and the another advanced for the whiteboard is that you can invite your students to collaboratively um, write anything on the whiteboard or have the have them uh, using the whiteboard inside of a breakout rooms um, and um, I know that a lot of instructors have already tried using media representations like showing a poster or play the YouTube video in the uh, um, face-to-face -face class. In the Zoom session, you can do the same. Uh, it's the easy way. Just share the screen and go to the YouTube and share the YouTube video you're playing. And if you don't have time to show the entire video clips or poster, you can send them the links through chat window uh, so that the students can um, go to the link, review the documents or review any media links after class. And the polling, traditionally, the, the teacher just asks students' opinion and students uh, freely talked or they raise their hand to give an answer, yes or no. And in the Zoom, you can also try the Zoom poll um, feature. That means you only need to uh, have this question ready and uh, you can click on Zoom poll fe um, features and then students will choose an answer, yes or no, or you can use uh, multiple choice questions um, to do a very quick uh, quizzes 
so that you check in their understanding about an idea. And the uh, traditional ways to use quizzes um, is the students like um, writing down the answers through um, paper or you hand over the handouts. Um, and by using the, by um, doing the quiz online, you can use the um, Canvas quizzes or any other different kinds of uh, online quiz tools. It makes the um, quizzes in class more effectively that you, students doesn't need to uh, be worried too much about like uh, how to, like the timing and you can put the timing in the, uh, in the setting of the uh, Canvas quiz and you just send over the quiz link so that the students can take the quiz online. And the group discussion is the most um, important like ways for engage the students, both traditionally or in the Zoom setting. Um, normally the face-to-face -face teachers put the students in groups or pairs, have them uh, discuss um, like writing some uh, prompts for the students and let the students uh, group discuss. Uh, the same topic or different topics. In the Zoom breakout rooms, um, it, you can just need to uh, set up the Zoom previously or you can auto assign, uh, like for example, group the students by three, or you can uh, think and pair, group the students by two, and you just click on the Zoom breakout rooms. Then it will automatically send all your students by, by groups. And some uh, recent research show that um, Zoom breakout rooms actually save two minutes per 45 minutes lesson. Uh, because when in face-to-face -face settings, uh, there have a lot of transition time, the students moving their chairs around, or when it is ending time for the group discussion, they feel so hard to, uh, the teacher feels so hard to bring back the students to a big classroom discussion. But in Zoom breakout rooms, you set up the timing for, um, for their discussion, like the five minutes discussion. And the Zoom will automatically send a reminder when there is only one minute left and the students will be prepared. Okay, oh, time is up, time is end, and we need to um, speed up a little bit. So it's kind of make moving the discussion more efficiently. That's the uh, very basic um, strategies that you can try um, from the face-to-face -to, -face to Zoom. I just encourage everybody to think what you have already done in this in face-to-face -face and try to find a solution um, that has like similar solutions to uh, engage to engage the students in the online um, settings. Okay. And um, we know that in the, in the online course, the Zoom live session is very essential to, um, to include the students, feel them uh, like to uh, engage them into in-class discussions, in-class participation. But outside of class, there are definitely other ways that you can try to um, in, enhance the students' participation instead of providing them like heavy text course materials, you can um, like for multiple means of representations using the concept map, um, internet memes, diagram posters, um, and using some videos. You can create a welcome video at the beginning of the semester just to uh, briefly describe what's the course object and what's your expect expectation in general for the students. Or uh, if you have a very complex uh, Canvas layout, you can design um, Canvas navigation video, just to walk through the students, how to navigate your course. Okay, here is the course content, here is the module page, and here is the assignment you need to uh, submit, and here is where you can check your grades. And optionally, you can uh, use some short video lessons. It doesn't have to be like, original create by your own. You can best use some open resources, uh, borrow some uh, YouTube videos and short clips uh, you have already used um, in your past course. Or you, yeah. could, you could contact us mm -hmm. and here in the media studio, we can help you create your videos. Yeah, that's true. 
Just saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Moving along. Sorry. Yep. So I'm not, plug. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to uh, like describe each item. So this is something you can try in Canvas because the uh, I, I guess the most important thing that a lot of uh, instructors said that uh, it's very hard to process the group. So the Canvas group, you can uh, set up a group environment that the students can engage with each other. You can assign them as the group project the same way as in a face-to-face -face course. They can use a Zoom to chat with each other when they have a group discussion um, outside of class. And you can set up a group project to use the peer review uh, assignment or group assignments to facilitate their discussion outside of class. Yeah, so this is something uh, you can explore. And for the grading, um, I'm sure majority of you already know that in the Canvas grading, you can try to use the speak grader where you can annotate their, um, their paper, original paper. Um, in this way, you can highlight, for example, you can highlight some uh, student sentence and make a bubble comment so that the students will uh, feel that you are actually pay much attention to what their works. Um, they feel uh, is participate in the real time, uh, has the feedback directly from the instructors. And you can use the rubric um, to grade their, uh, the paper the paper based on a few different criteria, and you can align the assignment um, rubric into the learning outcome in the, for the entire course so that you can have a big picture of the student's performance across the entire semester. And, yeah, yeah. and Melody, one of the things that um, we're going to be um, providing for folks in our Getting Started series is a, is a way to look at the outcomes um, alignment in in Canvas. It's not the best. I would. I mean, I would have hoped mm -hmm. that Canvas would have uh, thought of a little more um, more detailed uh, mm -hmm. use of outcomes. But it is something for us. Um, and then along with Canvas Analytics, that definitely definitely does help. Um, so we're um, so thank you very much, Melody. Um, Folks, as you can imagine, we have an awful lot uh, in store for you, Melody and I uh, here in the hub. Um, you know, I say that you know, it's, it really is the innovation hub. Um, and we have a lot that we are going to be rolling out in service of you and uh, our students. And here is just um, for the rest of the year anyway, in this soft opening, uh, we have the learning series every Friday. And as I, I mentioned in the chat, I, I encourage you to think about perhaps something that you would like to share with our colleagues via this setting. So you could, starting in January 2021, because we already have, uh, for the rest of this calendar year, we already have this series all lined up. Um, but you could potentially, uh, if you wanted to, you could present with um, myself and Melody during one of these sessions. We can help you set it up. Um, we will do most of the work for you. It's, an, it's just a wonderful way for you to share and for us to learn from each other. You see here that session two, which is in a week from now, we're going to focus on differentiated instruction. Um, it's important that we learn how to differentiate with intent so that we don't put any more stress on ourselves and our students. So Melody and I are going to share some key strategies on how you can differentiate, which means literally how you can personalize. Uh, Megan knows the Megan knows how to differentiate, I know, how you can personalize uh, for groups of students. Everybody meets the same objectives, but perhaps they're doing it in different ways. And then we do have our Getting Started series that, that begins uh, Tuesday coming. Um, we are going to focus on Canvas. Here in the hub, we do have limited seats. Uh, Melody and I have to go around and count how many seats uh, um, for social distancing, but we will be limited uh, for obvious safety, uh, but we will have unlimited virtual um, for the same time. So essentially, you could choose to come on campus and sit down at a computer, bring your own computer, or sit down at one of ours, uh, or you could you could connect with us virtually, and we're going to go over some pieces of Canvas that you may be less familiar with, like SpeedGrader. And uh, to the English comp folks, um, uh, Melody is working. I know, Cleo, Melody is working. Um, actually, I don't know, Melody, did you come up with a, did you get an answer from um, Canvas yet about the speed grader issue? 
I was just typing the answer. So uh, <laughs> the speak reader sometimes can uh, varies from different browser. So I have uh, faculty members uh, reach out to me that they um, have this or that uh, kind of issue when they trying to grade because um, overall the speak reader is very complex uh, grading tool. So if you want to, um, let's say if you add a lot of uh, bubble comment in one piece of paper, uh, it can has a, uh, um, system errors or something uh, prevent you to save all the comments. So I recommend you to clear the uh, caches on your browser and open it in a new private window or new Concadito window or uh, switch it to different browser. I'd say Firefox works better than Safari or uh, the uh, Google Chrome. So just uh, try into different browser and clean caches is the first troubleshooting steps for you. And, and so it's it's issues like what some of us have experienced in SpeedGrader and perhaps um, other uh, features of Canvas that we, we, we tend to be struggling with that we're going to cover during the Getting Started series and the Spotlight series, which is going to be every other, just like we're gonna, it's going to alternate Getting Started Spotlight. Spotlight series is really going to allow us, it, that has to be here on campus. Again, we'll have limited seating. So it's going to be first time for a serve, but Spotlight is really going to allow you to come in uh, to the hub uh, roll up your sleeves, find a, find a comfy corner here with a computer and explore the, uh, whether it's an augmented reality software or perhaps virtual reality software, some piece of software that we do have currently available for you to use in your classroom. So for those of you who have labs, for those of you who um, maybe are, you're teaching a course that you want students to have those virtual tours, um, this would be for you because you know you really or for those of you who really want to have more interaction um, gamification is big and it's not just about playing Mario Brothers it is an, it's an actual way of <laughs> Charlie loves Mario Brothers right Charlie yeah <laughs> Mario Kart so it you know it's a way of, uh, of uh, allowing our students to interact with our content um, a, a little more deeply actually so this is what we have up and coming and uh, we're right at the one minute mark uh, so starting in January, we are going to have a grand opening of the hub, and that means that we will be able to roll out uh, our media studio. And we'll have more information about that, but it will truly be a place where you can come right here on campus and have your videos made, um, you know, with a lot more ease than you're probably current, currently experiencing. Um, more information will be rolling out uh, as we get closer to the grand opening. And with that being said, I wanna thank you all so, so much for joining us today. Again, this recording uh, will be available to you early next week along with the notes and the entire, uh, this whole PDF uh, will be, uh, the, the, the presentation rather, will be available via PDF along with references and, and other links and whatnot. Your time is very valuable and we do appreciate you sharing it with us today. So thank you to everybody for joining. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much for coming.